Ladies and gentlemen, will you remain standing, please, for the singing of the national anthem and for the invocation to follow, which will be delivered by Howard Radcliffe, the regional pastor and president of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Ohio. Thank 
join me in prayer? Almighty God, for glimpses of beauty, for hours of truth, for tastes of justice and the feel of freedom, for music and joy, for love and laughter, Lord, we love your world, this nation, and this place. Because we love the world, we pray now, O God, for grace to quarrel with it. O thou whose lovers quarrel with the world is the history of the world. Grant us grace to quarrel with the worship of success and power, with the assumption that people are less important than the jobs they hold. Grant us grace to quarrel with a mass culture that tends not to satisfy but to exploit the wants of people, to quarrel with those who pledge allegiance to one race rather than the human race, and with those who would condemn the faith of others rather than practice their own. Lord, grant us grace to quarrel with all that profanes and trivializes and separates us. Now number us, we pray, in the ranks of those who have gone forth from Bethany College, longing for those things which you set in our hearts, men and women for whom the complexity of the issues only serve to renew their zeal to deal with them, women and men who alleviate pain by sharing it, men and women who are willing to risk something big for something good. So may we leave in the world a little more truth, a little more justice, a little more beauty than would have been here had we not loved the world enough to quarrel with it for what it is not but could be. O God, take our minds and think through them, take our lips and speak through them, take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. It is a pleasure to welcome each one of you to this great day of liberation. That is for everybody who is here. The 20th century has been dominated by the physical sciences. That dominance has produced a galaxy of the finest scientists the world has ever known. In that galaxy, there is one star that shines as bright as the finest that are there. And that is the name and the work of Leon Letterman. He has served as a professor of physics at Columbia University, at the University of Chicago, at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And he has held the distinguished post of director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and was one of the leading scientists in the development of the super controlling super collider. Teacher, historian, mathematician, statistician, poet, and one of the nation's leading advocates for educational reform, Dr. Letterman has received many prizes. Included among those, the Enrico Fermi Prize, the Wolf Prize in Physics, the National Medal of Science, and in 1988, the Nobel Peace Prize. The work of Dr. Letterman extends from the massiveness of the universe to the micro world of the atom. And there are those who say, that Dr. Letterman is not on the cutting edge of science. He defines the cutting edge of science. It is both humbling and an honor to welcome to our podium today Nobel laureate, Dr. Leon Letterman. Thank you very much. President, trustees, parents, and uh, successfully liberated graduates. Uh, your teachers and administrators uh, have loved and cherished you for four long years, and they wish the best for you. Therefore, they insist that even at the very last moment, you get the best possible advice. 
the commencement speaker is a national ritual whose history I've not studied. I wouldn't be surprised if it dates back to Plato's Academy. Maybe Aristotle was the commencement speaker. Obviously, uh, the lords of Bethany have chosen a senior citizen. <clears throat> Actually, nowadays we call ourselves chronologically advantaged. <clears throat> Someone so old and wise that he can remember when the Dead Sea was only six. <clears throat> and they picked someone, as you've heard, with many credentials. I was once on a train, a crowded train coming out of Chicago, and at uh, the next station, a uh, nurse came on with some patients at the local mental institution. She was taking them on an outing, and uh, she tried to settle them. She had a clipboard. She counted them, one, two, three, four, and she looked at me and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm Leon Letterman, Nobel laureate and director of Fermilab. She said, yes, too bad, five, six. Uh, they also picked a scientist, teacher, professor. And to illustrate these professors, uh, we have the tensions that we're familiar with in academia. For example, professors and students band together against the dean. Uh, there's a sign in my university in the men's room by the electric hand dryer. It says, push for a message from the dean. You know, there's always a pause. <laughs> Students, in turn, band together against the teacher. One teacher asked her sixth grade students to get up and tell what their parents do for a living. And things went well with all the different kids until one kid got up and said, he said, my father plays a piano in a grovel. Well, the teacher immediately skipped quickly, horrified to the other kids, but asked the Willie to stay after school and invited the mother in. And he said, do you know what Willie said? And she whispered in the mother's ear and the mother smiled and said, well, yes, you know, his father is really a theoretical physicist, but how do you explain that to a little child? Uh, my trouble today is that I keep worrying about the two or 3,000 other commencement speakers at this moment, probably in places that haven't got nearly as nice a weather as we have. What are they telling the students? Uh, President Clinton, I read the newspapers, he's already given two or three commencement speeches on certainly critical issues of economics, of world trade, the importance of the college education. Al Gore also does his commencement stints with his usual dynamic presentation. Remember, he's only a heartbeat away from the vice presidency. He's an inspiration to thousands of Americans who suffer from Dutch Elm disease. Newt Gingrich gloats that the budget deficit will be zero by the year 2002 and that our children will be much better off, never mind education. Uh, I heard that Clinton and Gingrich uh, once decided to collaborate, uh, be bipartisan, and they took a hike in the woods and came across a huge black bear, at which point uh, Clinton took his Adidas out of his knapsack and quickly put him on. And Gingrich said, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And Clinton said, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <clears throat> anyway, with 3,000 schools contending, uh, commencement speakers like Oprah Winfrey and Jay Leno and President Bush and Stephen Jay Gould are in heavy demand, but you got me. One of my colleagues in this business has so many honors, it takes him a half hour to transfer his medals from his jacket to his pajamas every night. Theologians and philosophers are not forgotten in this national lust for commencement speakers. Graduates are reminded that men and women do not live by bread alone, that the fulfilling life must have an aesthetic and a moral dimension. Somewhere in this great land where commencement speakers echo from sea to shining sea, there are optimists. For example, the former Soviet nations will soon be market economy successes, and the Chicago Cubs will win the World Series. Pessimists have it too easy on commencement season, and academics and historians speak with passionate concern for the humanistic side of our civilization. And there are those who discuss the continuing, if not flagging, quest for society based on social justice. Economists make great commencement speakers, all the way from 
predictions of economic Armageddon if the Fed raises the interest rates another quarter percent to those who have the Dow Jones zooming past 10,000 by Tuesday. Please don't act on that. <clears throat> now, I am well known, uh, even <clears throat> blush famous among physicists, but my role as a commencement speaker is illustrated by the story that when President Bush was making a state visit to Helsinki, he asked to uh, place a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier. His Finnish hosts were puzzled as to what to do until one of them got an idea, so the procession of limousines went across Helsinki to a beautiful square, and there was a statue of Sibelius. Now, President Bush is a graduate of one of those East Coast mail order places, I think it was Yale. And he immediately recognized the statue, and he said, that's Sibelius, the famous uh, composer. And they said, yes, as a composer, he's famous. As a soldier, he's unknown. <laughs> OK. Having been totally disrespectful of commencement speakers, let me try to paint a picture of the world into which we're emerging from a biased point of view. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's biased of a scientist who loves the process of doing science, who worries about the consequences of the explosively growing knowledge base and of the awesome technologies that are now at hand. I'll do this in the context of the problems facing society, most of which, in fact, are induced by the spread of science and technology. So these are the major concerns facing citizens of your century, the 21st century. First is population. Uh, as exemplified by a meeting of world leaders in, uh, in Cairo. Now it's 5.7 billion, doubled since the 1950s. And it's expected to double again uh, early in the 21st century. And this is a, a major issue. This is the awesome power of the exponential growth. You can illustrate this by uh, taking a piece of paper, maybe out of your booklet, or maybe you can try this on your diploma and folding it in half, it's twice the thickness. Say two tenths of an inch, then fold it again, and you have four tenths of an inch. Now, if you fold it 40 times, don't try it on your diploma, but uh, the question is how thick will it be? Will it be two inches thick? Will it be five inches thick? Will it be 20 inches thick? The answer is it'll be 250,000 miles thick. That's the exponential uh, doubling, doubling 40 times, and you get uh, a trillion times the original thickness. That's a problem in population. <clears throat> Environment, there again, uh, the Rio conference in 1992, in which world leaders gathered, obviously uh, concerned about things like global climate change, the hole in the ozone layer, acid rain, the vanishing forests, the increase of toxic and nuclear waste. Since each human uses a certain amount of energy, depending on their standards of living, this is obviously connected to the first problem of population. There was also an increasing gap between the rich nations and the poor nations, between the quality of life of 80% of the world's population that live in the poor nations of Africa and Asia and Latin America, and the lucky 20% who live in industrial powers. And even, even within those uh, industrial powers, there is a huge disparity uh, between the uh, incomes of the wealthy and the poor, which in the United States is approaching a factor of 100, only beaten by Brazil. And the technology that we're so proud of, uh, unfortunately, tends to increase that gap as it is now deployed. A number, another problem is the vanishing or increasing scarcity of natural resources. That's the oil and the coal, fresh water and minerals, lumber. Well, what are the sensible projections? Uh, we live in a time of internet, of home computers more powerful than the mainframes of 10 or 20 years ago, of an awesome technology that changes our culture, our habits, our privacy as individuals, and our uniqueness as nations. The prefix global is everywhere. The best-selling U.S. car has bumpers made in Mexico, headlights in Canada, and tires in Sweden. And we know so much. We know today that our universe started about 10 billion years ago in an explosion, incomprehensible in its scale. In the incandescence of the first fraction of a trillionth of a second, matter and radiation existed in original form, primordial and crystalline, mathematically simple. The laws of nature must have dictated this creation and then supervised the expansion and cooling, supervised the gradual accretion of original matter into larger organizations, 
and govern the fluctuations which later became clusters of galaxies, soon billions of suns. Out of a primordial soup, protons and neutrons were formed. Eventually, hydrogen, helium, the heavier elements were cooked later in the ovens of dying stars. Somehow, on at least one tiny planet, at least one tiny planet, the millions of chemicals congeal to form proteins and eventually life. We're still wrestling with many of the details, but the broad outlines are pretty well understood. This knowledge base has given us a very large capability in technology. Uh, I, I can uh, remember the story of a Martian visitor who uh, came to Earth and was shown all of our clever inventions. This is a fax machine, and that's a magnetic resonance imaging device, and here's a jet airliner. And, he looked at all these inventions and then was asked, which one do you admire most? And he said, the thermos bottle. What? Yes, the thermos bottle. Look at that. It keeps hot liquids hot in midwinter, and it keeps cold liquids cold in hot summer. Little piece of glass like that. How does it know? Oh, well. <laughs> Now, at the end of the 20th century, can we assess these capabilities for addressing the problems I listed? This requires some projections of what we'll have in the 21st century, and I'll do this by giving you a very subjective view of the most profound scientific revolution in our century, as was mentioned by the president, a revolution that occurred actually in the laboratories of Europe in the 1920s. This revolution is called quantum theory. And because of it, we obtained understanding and control of atoms. Not only was the quantum world intellectually shocking, counterintuitive, wreaking a very profound change in the way physicists think of the world, but it had two other even more profound consequences. It created a vast technology based on devices, for example, the transistor or the laser. These devices and their sisters and cousins now account for some huge fraction of the gross domestic product of industrial nations. Physicists, incidentally, also invented the internet and the World Wide Web as an offshoot of quantum electronics. The second impact was to provide the basis for two other major revolutions, even more far-reaching. The first is the development of the electronic computer. Today, tens of millions of transistors can be packed into an area the size of your fingernail. Soon, this will be child's play as quantum computers increased speeds by factors of millions with un impossible to imagine consequences. Microprocessors, for example, will soon become so cheap that anything worth automating will be controlled by resident intelligences, which will monitor, control, adjust, repair factories, homes, hospitals, schools. The second offshoot, maybe the most profound, is the discovery of molecular biology. The biological revolution could be said to have been begun when one of the creators of the quantum theory, Erwin Schrodinger, wrote a book in 1990, 1944 called What is Life? in which he guessed that life could be explained by a genetic code organized by molecules within a cell. In the 1950s, inspired by Schrodinger, Watson and Crick applied quantum physics tools to reconstruct the atomic structure of DNA and to begin molecular biology. The genetic code of several living species are now totally deciphered. Viruses, yeast, single cell bacteria. Soon, with a human genome, we'll have what someone calls an owner's manual for the human body, just like the owner's manual for your Ford or Toyota. What is mind blowing as we project these revolutions to the next century is that they work together. So the old disciplines of chemistry, physics, biology, will in part give way to new organizations of research where scientists will be versed in quantum science, genetics, and computer science. Some of the technologies are beginning to emerge and will embarrass the imaginative authors of Star Trek. For example, atomic-sized sensors, motors, gears designed to manufacture things, a collaboration of mechanical engineering and molecular scientists. New kinds of factories are created a million times smaller than present factories and a million times faster to satisfy the needs and pleasures of customers, but with no pollution, no waste products, and almost no need for natural resources. And this is my main point. Once upon a time, a nation was wealthy because it had natural resources. Instead, oil, coal, 
minerals, water. Today, we see nations fully endowed with natural resources which live in dire poverty. And we see nations with no natural resources but living in great wealth because they have the brain power and imagination and invention and organization. I have two Macintoshes, one which is about 20 years old, very early Macintosh, and one which is a brand new power book. They weigh almost the same. The newer one is lighter. If you analyze them, they're 15% plastic, 8% silicon, and so on. There's some iron and gold and copper and glass. The same quantities in both Macintosh, but one is 100 times faster than the other. The same materials, someone rearranged the materials and made an object which is 100 times faster, 100 times more valuable. What was that? It was a human brain. And now we ask, can the brain continue to rearrange materials and improve the computer? Are there any limits? Let's compare. I heard of a new chemical plant that is mobile. It can travel and find the simplest of its raw materials, water and grass. It produces a perfect food supplement. It is self-repairing, and eventually it can produce a copy of itself. Of course, I'm talking about a cow. Compared to a cow, Automated factories of today are low technology. A tree that manufactures wood and leaves using solar energy and water and purifies the air at the same time is much more technological than our most fancy uh, computers or automated factories. So we have a long way to go before we can replicate the cleverness of nature on the molecular level. Okay, let's agree the human brain can't be limited in its ability to solve problems. And as our technologies and the rapid spread of these technologies continues, there arises a fascinating possibility with which I will leave you. There is now the opportunity to develop an initiative for the 21st century, which will leave legacies for science and society. What we visualize is the mobilization of all human knowledge towards the realization of a prosperous, sustainable, equitable, and stable society. Advances in science and technology are bringing such a luminous future into the realm of possibility in your century. This means a global society in which all the basic human needs, food, clothing, shelter, good health, and a fair share of human wants can be met while maintaining indefinitely a healthy and attractive environment. What is needed are entirely new patterns of collaboration. We must include here a broadly based knowledge strategy involving the utilization of knowledge about the nature and interactions of matter, living organisms, energy, information, but also culture and human behavior, an alliance of the natural, health, and social sciences, the arts, and the humanities. And that's why it's always a pleasure to come to a liberal arts school like Bethany, where all of these things are treated with great respect. Also, we need new modes of collaboration between business and industry, academia, academia, government, and non-governmental organizations. And all of this makes possible, is made possible by the incredible revolution in communication technology. We are describing a new world, a global knowledge-based society, and of course, education is the overarching requirement, and lifelong learning becomes a cliche of almost all commencement. What is the message of this commencement? Well, I've acted as a technological optimist in giving you a glimpse of what it is possible to do. A vision of a world without war, without dire poverty, without disease, and with a reasonable opportunity for all the inhabitants to live fulfilling lives in harmony with nature. But just because this can happen doesn't mean it will happen. In dark moments, in the despair of our cities and the banality of our popular culture, the American model of optimism and sense of progress seems played out. America, the world leader, is no longer young. It is dense with inequality and social tension. And for the first time in our history, our children, you, may see the future as worse than the past. May, many of you may have it harder than your parents had it. And we are keenly aware of the human elements of greed and fear which seem to be in ascendancy as we survey the events in our nation. So we come to a kind of fork in the road. As the famous American philosopher Yogi Berra said, is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. To know what to do, to give you guidance on this road, you have to educate yourself. Lifelong learning. Or another, you have just begun to learn. But it doesn't mean it's wrong because it's a cliche. So science literacy in the 21st century will be as bad as not knowing how to read or write in the 20th century. 
just as we can't leave war to generals, we can't leave science to scientists. We have to leave it to informed citizens. And even more so, if you have already headed for a science or technical career, you had better know something about history and geography, something about the wisdom of ancient culture, not only the Greek and Roman, but the Asian and African, something about music and the literature and the arts. Knowledge without wisdom of the humanities is dry as dust. And for my final point, I'll close with the story of the hungry mouse who was starving, knew exactly where the cheese was on the kitchen table, but was afraid to leave it cold because there's an animal walking outside. Well, after a moment or two, the animal bought. <coughs> oh, said the mouse, that's the dog. I can run faster than the dog. So the mouse ran out of the hole. The cat jumped on the mouse, ate him up, and as he cleaned his whiskers, he says, it's also important to know two languages. Thank you. Dr. Wallace Neal will present our first candidate for an honorary degree. Mr. President, John U. Davis came to Bethany following military service with the 1st Cavalry Division. Bethany is a family school. His mother, aunt, uncle, wife Mary Ann, and daughter Martha attended Bethany. In the 10 years after graduation, John taught, served as a school principal, and earned a doctorate from Columbia University. Returning to his alma mater in 1966, he worked on committees as department chair and served Beta Theta Pi fraternity until his retirement. He was a strong advocate for women's athletics and was Bethany's NCAA faculty representative. The education department became nationally accredited under his direction, continuing its practical emphasis on a constructivist approach. Quoting him, education is a do-it-yourself job. Teachers provide the conditions, learners do the learning. He had a special interest in moral education and wrote, Moral Education in Theory and Practice with Robert P. Hall after attending Oxford and Harvard. During his seven summers at Bethany, he taught economics to teachers at the University of Nebraska. He worked several years for the West Virginia Department of Education and taught graduate courses at West Virginia University and Detroit University. He designed and taught Bethany's first statewide satellite television course for teachers. He is perhaps best known for his teaching of educational philosophy to hundreds of teachers in the Ohio Valley through the University of Dayton's graduate program. Upon retirement, he became an editor with Nassau's Classroom of the Future education program. Admired for his enthusiasm and curiosity for learning, his standard reply was, I cannot tell the difference between my work and my pleasure. He now resides in Emerald Isle, North Carolina, with Mary Ann Stickrath Davis, class of 56, his wife of 40 years. Mr. President, for his loyal service to his alma mater, for representation of the college in the academic world, and for his enthusiasm as a teacher, I present Dr. John Ulrich Davis for the degree of Doctor of Pedagogy, Honoris Causa. John Davis, with the authority invested in me through the charter of this institution as given to us by the Old Dominion, and with the abiding affection that comes from personal friendship, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Pedagogy Honoris Causa, with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertain. My congratulations.
Dr. Rebecca Genova will present our next candidate. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even the young shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Howard M. Ratcliffe has apparently taken the words of the prophet Isaiah quite literally, for he is both a private pilot and a marathon runner. But more importantly, he has applied these skills and interests in the service of God in the church. Mounting up with wings like eagles, he has led several mission trips to the rural projects in Ecuador, consulted with the evangelical churches of Indonesia, served as a consultant with the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, and was a delegate for the National Council of Churches in dialogue with the Russian Orthodox Churches in Russia. Only the skills of a runner keep him from not getting weary in his current capacity as the regional pastor and president of the Christian Church in Ohio. He is responsible for the pastoral oversight of the region's 206 congregations. He chairs the personnel committee for the Ohio Council of Churches, and chairs the Task Force on Renewal and Structural Reform for the Disciples of Christ. In addition, he has worked with Camp Christian and the Cairo Camping Program, is involved in the Ohio Board for United Ministries in Higher Education, and is a trustee of Hiram College. Truly, the words of the Apostle are echoed in the life of Howard M. Radcliffe. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Mr. President, it is my privilege to present the Reverend Howard M. Radcliffe to the degree of Doctor of Divinity, Honorary Calpa. By the authority invested in me through the charter of this institution as issued by the Old Dominion, and with many warm memories, Howard, of the years of colleagueship we shared in service of the Church, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Divinity, Honorary Calpa, with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. My congratulations. The next candidate will be presented by Dr. Lynn Atkins. Mr. President, the book of Job speaks to us about the issue of where wisdom is found. We are told that God understands the way to it, and God knows its place. George Archer Hearn, like many Bethany graduates, has made a search for wisdom. As a religious studies major at Bethany, he is familiar with this church as described in Job. His educational and career endeavors provide evidence of a continued search. The important search for wisdom marks the character of the individual we honor today. His life work has been dedicated to the pulling together of religion and education to help other people grasp the meaning of wisdom. His board membership, career accomplishments, in higher education provide testimony to this faithful journey. In the tradition of Alexander Campbell, founder of Bethany College, this candidate has developed a deep understanding that wisdom is created by the combination of spirituality and educational application. His work of, as a leader within the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and his dedication to higher education cause us to pay tribute to his many years of service to these important institutions. Family, church service, eldership, scholarship, and administration give evidence to a commitment to improve the world in which we live. Through these years of service, wisdom has been found and passed on to generations of learners. Mr. President, today we celebrate the contribution to wisdom made by this candidate through his ministry within the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and his outstanding career in higher education. It is my privilege to present to you George Archer Hearn, 
to continue to search for wisdom by weaving together a commitment to Christian service and education, the degree of Doctor of Laws, honors cousin. Vested in me through the charter of this institution as issued by the Old Dominion, and with the keenest empathy for your responsibilities as a college president, Jordan, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Law honoris causa, with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. Congratulations. The next candidate will be presented by Dr. Russell Clothing. Part of the liberal arts lies a desire to understand the world in which we live. As scholars, the artists, the economists, and the philosopher use their talents to explore the world around them. As educators, they share their enthusiasm and their understanding with their students and their peers. By this standard, Dr. Leon Letterman epitomizes the scientist in the liberal arts. As a scholar, he has been a modern-day democritus searching for the fundamental atomos of which matter is constructed. Of the 12 fundamental particles of matter, Dr. Letterman has discovered two, the muon neutrino and the bottom quark. He has served as director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and as president of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. For his achievements, the scientific community has awarded him its highest honor the 1988 Nobel Prize in Physics. As exceptional as his research has been, it is even more exceptional to find a scientist of Dr. Letterman's caliber so actively engaged in education and society. Dr. Letterman has written several books using his legendary wit and storytelling ability to explain particle physics to non-scientists. Dr. Letterman remains an active teacher uh, focusing primarily on introductory courses for undergraduates. His concern for public education has led him to found the Leon Letterman Science Education Center, the Teachers Academy for Mathematics and Science, which trains Chicago public school teachers, and the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, a public magnet school that boasts the highest ACT scores in the nation. In short, Leon Letterman represents the highest ideals of the liberal arts. His combination of outstanding scholarship, devotion to education, and service to the community should serve as a role model for all future scientists. Mr. President, it is with great pleasure that I present Dr. Leon Letterman, author, scholar, and educator for the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. By the authority vested in me through the charter of this institution as issued by the Old Dominion, and with the highest regard for all of the contributions you have made to humankind, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. Congratulations. Let us stand and join in the singing of America.
Dr. William Whipple, Dean of the Faculty, will present the class of 1997. Mr. President, listed in our official program are the names of the candidates who have met all the requirements for graduation from Bethany College, and I hereby certify that they are worthy to receive the degree of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts from this historic college. Will the candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science please rise? By authorization of the faculty and the trustees of Bethany College, Mr. President, I present these candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science. With the authority invested in me through the charter of this institution, as issued by the Old Dominion, I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Science, with all the rights and privileges therein to appertain. It has happened at last, and congratulations to each of you. Jennifer Lee Agen, magna cum laude. Richard Border, summa cum laude. Sean Thomas Brown, summa cum laude. Tara Lee Brumby, cum laude. Jason Frederick Cassidy, magna cum laude. Bethany Lynn Davis. Karen. Suzanne Ferrari, summa cum laude. Alexander D. Gehring. Robert Allen Hoffman, cum laude. Christopher L. Jackson. Eric Knoll. Jill Marie Proud, magna cum laude.
John Douglas Loy, magna cum laude. Stephen Joseph Lynn. Joseph Edward Martin, summa cum laude. Ryan Stewart Meek. Barbara Jean Mills. Jamie Lynn Parker, cum laude. Karen A. Pickett. Sean Eric Rouse. Aaron Jeffrey Reesmeyer, cum laude. Sarah A. Snell, magna cum laude. Reka P. Srinivasan, cum laude. Janelle Adrian Taylor. Please be seated. Will the candidate for the degree of Bachelor of Arts please rise? By authorization of the faculty and the trustees of Bethany College, Mr. President, I present these candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts. With the authority vested in me through this institution, through the charter of this institution as issued by the Old Dominion, and with the solemn assurance to each of you that I have indeed signed your diploma, I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Arts with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertain, and with my warmest congratulations. Robert Eric Armstrong, magna cum laude. Melissa Lynn Aubrey.
Ryan Edward Avolio. Natalie Renee Baird. Amy Rebecca Barr, summa cum laude. Jonathan Maurice Blackman. Michael B. Varello. Christy Lynn Bauer, summa cum laude. Gwen Margaret Bowman, cum laude. Melissa Ann Bradley. Elizabeth K. Rotten. Douglas William Brown. Michelle Renee Burnett. Richard J. Burnett. Janine Estelle Viney List. Joseph Albert Carpino. J. C. Catherine. Christy Paul Tui, summa cum laude. Aaron Reed Cooper. Christy Michelle Cunningham, cum laude. Courtney P. Davis, magna cum laude. Larry K. Dennison, Jr. Danelle Lee Doty, cum laude.
Kristen Ann Dougherty. Heather Marie Elias. Elizabeth Henry Fitz. Laura Elaine Fitt, magna cum laude. Eric Christopher Freed. Kevin Paul Galonia, summa cum laude. Jennifer M. Garcia. Edward Jared Gombes, cum laude. Terry Lee Goodwin, cum laude. David I. Gross. H. Charles Ham the Third, cum laude. Jody Handley, summa cum laude. Ellen Jane Kerr, cum laude. Lisa Jean Hicks, summa cum laude. Anya Ann Hunt, cum laude. Tracy G. Pop, cum laude. Dimitri Eon. Harry Jackson. Junior. Kurt Vinton Kinzel. Jason R. Klein. Yeah. 
Greg A. Chemitsky. Kevin Patrick Joseph. Brett Andrew Christine. Robin Marie Lanyetsky, cum laude. Gary Lynn Laska, summa cum laude. Matthew C. Madison. John Michael McCarthy. Marilyn Marie McCloskey. Michael James McCall, cum laude. Brian Joseph McFarland. Jennifer Green McGlone, cum laude. Rebecca R. Nedvitt. David Anthony Michael, summa cum laude. Denise Ray Miller, cum laude. Melissa Ann Maori, cum laude. Dauda M. M. Jai. Stephen. M. Edsel. Oh. Neil Fraser Hogg. Todd Durye Ollinger. <laughs> Natsue Otani, magna cum laude.
Christy Jo Papini. Anika Marie Pierce. Alden Bird Powell. Connie Christine Randall, cum laude. David A. Rathbun. Brent Allen Reynolds, summa cum laude. Patrick J. Ritchie. Aaron John Roberts, summa cum laude. Michael Frederick Rogers. Christopher Christian Rourke. Jamie Ray Rutter, cum laude. Ace Andrew Ryan. Dana Marie Samuel, summa cum laude. Janice Lynn Sanfrey, cum laude. Joel John Lucas Santos. Tara Lee Schultz, summa cum laude. Amy Dorothea Seifart. Cum laude. Melissa Ann Schaefer. Wendy Lorraine Schaefer. Cum laude. Stacy Lynn Silva.
David Bradley Simpson, magna cum laude. Patrick J. Stein. Ayana Smith. <laughs> Micah Griffith Spark. <laughs> Mark. Jefferson St. On. Brian Stephan. Jesse Sanford Thompson. Cum laude. L. Paul Vidic. J. Edward Wildpret. Marcy McFarland Williams, cum laude. Laura L. Wolf, summa cum laude. David Lee Wright, Jr. Jennifer Marie Yakinit, cum laude. Cedric A. Young. Matthew Anton Gillis. Please be seated. At this time, we will be awarding the Orion E. Scott Award. Stephen College, Dr. William Ripple will present that award. The Orrin E. Scott Award 
is presented each year to the graduating senior who has the highest overall grade point average. This year, the award goes to Kevin Galoni. Kevin, would you please come forward? Kevin's achievements are the stuff that legends are made of. He has completed a, a double major in two of our most demanding disciplines, Spanish and economics, earning a 4.0 average and receiving distinction on both comprehensive exams. He was named the outstanding senior in both of these departments, and he won this year's Francis O. Carper Prize for the most outstanding senior in the entire college. He has studied abroad on two occasions, in Ecuador when he was in high school, and in Spain while he was here at Bethany. In the field of economics, Kevin's senior project consisted of a complex quantitative comparison of macroeconomic functions under totalitarian and free market economies. Professor Allenstein describes it as one of the most sophisticated undergraduate projects he has ever seen. Kevin's GMAT scores were higher than the average score for students accepted into graduate programs at any university except for Stanford. Therefore, it is no surprise that he was accepted to the Fisher School of Business at Ohio State University with a full fellowship and living allowance. I predict that Kevin will push the envelope at Ohio State just as he has done at Bethany, and I do hope they are ready for it. Kevin has been very closely associated with Bethany's Foreign Language Day program even before he came to this point. As a high school student, he won a scholarship at the 1993 Foreign Language Day for his outstanding recitation in Spanish. In his freshman year, he volunteered to help out with preparation for Foreign Language Day, and he subsequently assumed positions of increasing responsibility. This year, he served as student director, a position requiring that he recruit and organize a core of over 100 student volunteers. He did that exceptionally well. In an unguarded moment, uh, Kevin did reveal the secret of his success at this to uh, Dr. Nelson, but I am not going to disclose it here. That's the sort of secret, Kevin, that's worth money, and I think we could sell it. Thinking about Kevin, I was reminded of powder milk biscuits. I don't know if you uh, remember G G Garrison Keeler's powder milk biscuits, but if you do, you remember that uh, they gave you the strength get up and do what needs to be done. And I think that uh, applies to Kevin. You put a challenge in his path, and he will find a way to meet it. However, some recent research made it clear that the dietary component of Kevin's success was not biscuits. It was rice pudding. Over the past few years, Kevin has contributed his celebrated rice pudding for international dinners and Spanish club events. The recipe, I'm told, has been in his family for generations, and I believe that it's actually Kevin's mother who prepares it whenever it's needed. I uh, have done a statistical study, and I have discovered that during the years that Kevin has been serving rice pudding to the Bethany community, our academic performance has been moving steadily upward. I don't think this is a coincidence. Kevin, we're going to miss you. We'll miss your insightful analysis on economic matters, You'll miss your enthusiasm for the study of other languages and cultures. You'll miss your air of general helpfulness when anybody needs a hand. And we're going to miss that rice pudding. We congratulate Ohio State on winning you as a graduate student, and we proudly present you with this year's Orange Scott Award. Three or four brief announcements. First, we have shared accolades to the graduating class this year, and they are very well deserved. 
It is time now to pay tribute to the parents of this class. And if the parents would stand, I would invite the graduates to join me in applause for the parents in helping to guide you through these four years. On the platform are two other groups that have been very instrumental in the education you have received during these four years. One group is the faculty, the other is the board of trustees. If those two groups would please stand, all of us will join in tribute to them. Dr. Robert Sandercock was attending his 40th and final commencement as an officer of the college and will be moving into retirement in June. <laughs> we want to join in expressing our appreciation to Bob for his many years of devoted service to Bethany College. Will you join me please? Let us join in the singing of our alma mater. May we hear the words of blessing and benediction. As we leave this place and venture into new frontiers, may the wisdom of God inspire us. May the love of God redeem and unite us. May the power of God humble us and keep us in awe. And may the joy of God be lightened. Amen.